Welcome to Dateline Health. This is Fred Lippman coming to you from Nova Southeastern University, and we're coming to you from the new Allen B. LeVan NSU Broward Center of Innovation. This is uh, an incredible new venue on the campus of Nova Southeastern University, and we're very proud to be in this new television studio that we are in. Uh, this is our 556th show, and uh, well, that means that I've been, uh, you've been allowing me to come into your houses and homes and wherever you watch for the last, uh, I guess, uh, 23 years, 24 years, whatever. Uh, the bottom line is, is that um, we thank you. Today we have uh, a, a good, wonderful returning star, uh, and it relates to women's health uh, update, and we call it 2022 update. But uh, it, it, Dr. Jay Cohn is not only a, a, an obstetrician gynecologist, but he's a, a tremendous advocate. Welcome, Dr. Jay Cohn. Welcome. Thank you very much, sir, and it's a privilege to be here. Thank you. Tell us about, I understand you're at the new uh, HCA hospital right here at uh, the HCA University Hospital, which uh, abuts the uh, Nova Southeastern University campus. Uh, talk to us a bit about that very quickly. Well, we're very privileged to be part of this hospital. It's uh, part of the HCA chain. I've been uh, in the community for 32 years. Um, very privileged to be uh, in the community uh, and been have actually been an uh, extraordinary career from, I have a lot of wonderful patients and we bring in patients all the way from Naples to Boca to down in South Miami, Aventura, all over. Uh, as you know, that uh, some of the hospitals have given up obstetrical care because of medical malpractice uh, reasons and financially, whatever the reason is. So we get a lot of people traveling. The beauty of this hospital is that it's state of the art. It is a level three nursery. They take 23 weekers and above. So they have full in-house neonatologists that are able to provide service 24 hours uh, at a time in-house to our sickest babies. Occasionally babies do have to be sent out for cardiac or whatever to different types of hospitals down south. Um, but it's very uncommon that this has. So basically plantation has closed and we moved everything up to the university. All the delivery rooms are private. Um, they're, they're, it's like being in a Ritz Carlton hotel. Uh, the postpartum rooms are all private too. We have uh, uh, staff that's completely dedicated for uh, breastfeeding and women's and, and child's care, um, fully staffed. And we also have in-house anesthesia. Also the hospital is, we operate our gynecological there. It has orthopedics, they're gonna have neuro. And the nice thing is, is that in another month we're gonna be moving because the brand new medical office buildings which attach to the hospital we're gonna be moving into, which will make things a lot easier. So it's as though we're with our patients laboring the entire time. Well, that's, we, we welcome you. We're, we're very proud of, uh, of having the hospital right here. Uh, with, uh, with reference to uh, the OB and gynecology uh, area, I know you, you said you were level three uh, I don't know if the folks really know what level three is, but would you mind explaining to the viewers what level three care is? Um, there's certain hospitals that can only take low risk patients or low risk babies. So if, if say in some areas, if a woman has preterm labor or high blood pressure, or the babies are have to be delivered early and they're not over a certain age or 37 weeks or 30, those women have to deliver at hospitals or it's suggested to that those women deliver at hospitals where they're able to provide care for those babies. Or they deliver at a hospital and the babies have to be shipped out or medevaced out or whatever. And this is what you see a lot of places in rural areas or across the country. A level three means that they're able to take babies, like I said, from we've had babies born that have done well from less than a pound. 
Okay, and this hospital is high risk in the fact that they, they have a certificate that allows them to take care, just like a hospital like Joe, Joe DiMaggio or Children's. And these are staffed by full in-house doctors uh, that are neonatologists that specifically are trained for these high risk, uh, uh, low birth infants or problems that may occur even at full birth weight, et cetera, where babies usually do not have to be sent out like at other facilities that may be. You also, uh, and again, I, I don't like to use uh, acronyms, but you, you have the, the, the highest level. You have a, a NICU and a step-down unit. And you want to explain that to the viewers? Sure. So, you know, we get a lot of patients that come in all the time and ask us, you know, uh, your level of, of hospital, if there's a problem with the baby, do they need to be transferred out or whatever? This hospital is so-called one-stop shopping. You know, we have anesthesia, we have NICU, we have um, the neonatologists also make rounds if there's any problems uh, with the baby. So they will see the baby's postpartum uh, also for the patients until the patients are left, uh, leave the hospital and then follow up with their routine pediatricians. You know, medicine's changing. Uh, where doctors or pediatricians used to come and make rounds. Now they'll see the baby postpartum and the neonatologist will make rounds or the neonatologist nurse practitioner and then make sure that everything's fine. So the hospital is very well staffed. The nice thing also is, is that if we need a, a patient's in labor and we need to do an emergency C-section or have to put an epidural in, the, house, the hospital has full-time in-house anesthesiologists where we don't wait for someone to come in from home. Also, the emergency room uh, is, is 24 hours, and it's really a state-of-the-art facility with radiology equipment um, and the medical staff that they have with them. Also, um, go ahead, sir. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, Dr. Cohn, go right ahead. So nice thing is, is that since it's so close, I'm the clerkship director. We do have our medical students that from NOVA, whether it be from the allopathic or the osteopathic program, with us. So um, as far as the, their learning, they're at a level three facility. They're with their, their uh, in our group, we have preceptors. They're with the, the doctors. They get one-on-one -on -one, um, teaching and really it works extremely well for that. And that's where we're very privileged to be part and, uh, and on campus uh, with the NOVA facility. Well, the, 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 the one thing that you know, because I know that you know an awful lot and have been very, very helpful to Nova Southeastern over the years. Uh, uh, we, we love seeing you within steps of my, my office building. How about my office? And I'm, I don't own the building. Uh, the bottom line is, is that our students, uh, don't forget, we have five, really six colleges and about 31 nationally accredited programs in the health professions area. So many of the people that you spoke about, whether they be, you know, certified re registered nurse practitioners or whether they be, uh, you know, anesthesia, uh, anesthesia assistants, uh, whether they be uh, medical school students from the osteopathic school, which is a founding school, or the, the new allopathic school. It's, it's just a wonderment to me and so satisfying to know that we have the ability to collaborate. A collaboration to me is the essence of where healthcare is going and has arrived. One of the things that the, uh, this insidious pandemic has brought to the health, I guess you could say, compendium, is that people have learned within the healthcare systems that they can't do everything by themselves. I think that there's, I probably couldn't have said it better. I mean, I, I think you're 100% right. I think with the collaboration there also, um, and I would just think what you're saying with the pharmacy uh, uh, program that's there and the practitioner and the, and the, and the, the, the students that are in the emergency room. I mean, everything is put together. And I agree with you. This pandemic has taught us that we just cannot do it alone. We need each other from infectious disease to OB to pediatricians. We all need to collaborate, to discuss, to communicate with each other. And that's what's really, uh, it's been, listen, it's been a very scary situation for the past couple of years. And hopefully we're somewhat out of it. Um, but I, I agree with you 100%. I see it also in the healthcare workers. Uh, I, I think it's absolutely amazing as to the uh, 
the ability of the healthcare community and particularly the workers that keep your hospital going 24 hours a day. Sometimes I think it's 28 hours within the 24 hours. Uh, and to think that they have given so much back to the patient population. Uh, it, it, it's really very sweet and heartening to me. And I, I believe we've gotten so many comments from the viewers. Uh, I'm sure it must affect you being in your position. It, it happened, you know, it, it's funny. Um, look, when, when, when the pandemic hit us full blown in March, April, May, you know, we really didn't know what to expect. We were, I mean, I'm not gonna lie to you. I mean, I have grandchildren, I was scared. Um, I w was dealing with this in the emergency room, delivering patients. We were checking for COVID patients. We were delivering patients from COVID. I walked in with a mummy outfit. I can barely breathe when I operated because of these masks that were so tight that I was never used to. And it was like watching a movie on Netflix because none of us and the information coming from the CDC and from and from the doctors on TV. And then a week later, it was changed and and we didn't know. But, you know, it's funny. I would see people at my building or where I live or if I would go to Starbucks and they would say, you know, we really appreciate. Thank you. You know you know, for what you're doing, or, or people would call the medical staff heroes. And, and I don't believe that the medical staff looked at themselves as heroes. I mean, you know, I trained at Jackson Memorial Hospital where we we're doing 18,000 deliveries a year. And when I started in the 80s, there was something called that none of us knew about called HIV. That was now coming into vogue. We didn't know about anything. We the people would, would show up with tuberculosis, rashes, skin lesions, and we didn't know what it was, but we were all afraid because we didn't know what to deal with. So I don't believe the medical staff, in the, especially in the intensive care unit, and yes, we gave up uh, uh, elective surgeries because there was just no rooms in the hospital, looked at themselves as being heroes. I think it was just what we've always wanted, we thought we should be doing in a, in a world where if they're sick people, we take care of them. And if we don't do it, who else is going to do it? And it, it has changed. And, and, and I could tell you, our hospital has really brought the staff together. I mean, everyone relying on each other, making sure that this person is properly dressed, that has the right uniform on, the right mask, that the equipment is correct. We looked out for each other. OK, and that we had never really done before. It was more on an individual. And that has really changed. But as far as I looked at everyone. I didn't know how these nurses from the emergency room, when I would go there, the nurses from the intensive care unit, the infectious disease doctors, just in my book were just unbelievable. They, they looked at it. It was just a day, a, a day at work, just to had to just be extremely careful. And they were just dealing with something that they never expected to be. Yeah. Let me get into uh, just a sort of a, uh, well, two things. Number one is uh, I heard you in your uh, first paragraph of conversation talk about uh, the, the care of, uh, of uh, uh, newborns that were a thousand grams or more. I'm very pleased to hear what you said about the thousand gram. Yeah, 500. Yeah, even the 500. I mean, I've, I've delivered uh, twins where the babies were just under 500, or whatever. But, you know, with the advent of, of surfactant to help the lungs mature um, with with the technology that they have now it, and using magnesium sulfate, which we just used to use for preterm labor to help with what we call neuro, the brain protection this is all data that's coming out now that we've never used before. It, it, it is amazing. And these, these children do well. I mean, but, and this is all probably in the last 20, 25 years. And not only to even talk about, I give a, a talk on where we're going with umbilical stem cell collection, as far as cerebral palsy, type one diabetes, autism spectrum disorder, collecting stem cells from the umbilical cord for, for the different types of structures, spinal cartilage, uh, thing. The, uh, this whole area is exploding, okay, to where we have right now in what we're going to be using uh, for. And I believe in the future, it's almost going to be standard of care, what we collect for and able to use for these, for our children later on in life. Well, it's, it's very heartening to me to hear what you're saying, because, uh, I spent uh, a good deal of my public service in the, in the area that you're talking about right now. So thank you. Thank you very much. 
you're, you're a hero in my heart, okay? Uh, let me, uh, you know, let me touch on something because with this, we, we, we spoke a bit about the, the pandemic, the insidious pandemic. And I, I don't know whether we, it's, you know, we, nobody knows what's going to happen. Here you are, a great human being, an obstetrician gynecologist with multiple years of experience. What do you say to that thought about not... That's tough. Look, we have a divided society. Um, and there's people that think that any vaccines may cause autism. Some of them think that it may lead to a decrease in mental capacity. So here's what I tell them. I'm governed by the American College of OBGYN, which is my board certification. Okay, so we always quote the American College, especially with the way medical malpractice the whole bit. Pregnancy alone is an immunocompromised state. So what does that mean to our audience is that Patients that get sick in pregnancy that usually get a cold may take two weeks to get rid of that cold. They may have more of a, of a harder cough or their fever may be a little bit higher. So it's an immunocompromised state. Here you are with a, 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 a pandemic that we're going through. The current recommendation by the American College of OBGYN is that all patients get vaccinated. Okay. Okay. Either before they're thinking of being pregnant or while they're pregnant. Now, my daughter in law just just had her baby and she got her booster at 20 weeks. Okay. And it's not a live attenuated virus that you wouldn't give like rubella. Okay. That does harm. We have a lot of data and I believe that the benefits far outweigh the risks. And that's how I talk to my patients. However, I don't force anything on these patients. I just give them my medical opinion and I refer them to the American College of OBGYN, uh, what recommendations, which is easily to be brought up on, on social network Google or to the CDC, which they also recommend. So my answer to your question is, is that I recommend it. I highly recommend it. I believe that they need to be boosted if it's time for it. And I think it's extremely important, just like we recommend a flu vaccine, just like you're going to see RSV for the recid residual uh, uh, virus for uh pulmonary problems or a thing in children that they're going to start giving mothers that are pregnant. Just like we use tetanus, diphtheria, pertussis for whooping cough that we give from, from uh, 28 to 36 weeks to help protect the baby. I think that it's a recommendation and I go and I use it. I think it's extremely important. Well, thank you, Dr. Cohen. I, I, I just thought, you know, there are people that, that, might disagree, but I, I really think you put you put it. Hey, hey, you put it right on. You put it right on the on the table. You know, you nailed it down. Look and see. This comes up a lot. I just want you to know, Doctor Levin. It really, it it comes up all the time, and patients will ask for your opinion. But you know, we still have a lot of people come in that do not want to get vaccinated. And I will tell you that that just for me, from what I hear, is that they'll say to me. I didn't want to get vaccinated. I had COVID four months ago. I was sick as a dog. I can't believe how sick I was. I probably should have taken the vaccine. Okay. So again, I'm not here to judge or to force. I'm just here to educate and to recommend. And it's up to the patients to make their own decision, just like with anything else. Well, the greatest, the greatest power we have as a human species is knowledge. So I appreciate it. Let, let me uh, get to some uh, I have just some basic things. Uh, uh, obviously, we, we have a lot of folks that uh, I always tell them at the end of the show, take good care of yourself. You know, <clears throat> instead of going into uh, uh, a supermarket or a pharmacy or whatever, and you get a little something that's bothering you, you take something off the shelf, and then you you know you don't get to see, especially you know people of a younger age. Let's say the you know, younger age. I'm not going to say the uh, what what age it is, uh, but they, you know, they don't get to see their doctors. All right, uh, they don't get their annual checkups. But yet, all of a sudden now, you have uh, a young lady who, uh, whatever or, or whatever, a female uh, at any uh, whatever age is they carrying a, a child, they're pregnant. Uh, how often should they be seen by the OB? Okay, that's an excellent question. Okay, so let's let's divide those patients into pregnant versus not pregnant versus wanting to become pregnant versus perimenopausal versus menopausal. So that's how I, the group. 
if you ask me the question, what I will bring up is, is that I believe that, that, that any woman that becomes sexually active and we're having a lot of people that we see at 15, 16, 17, uh, you know, these are kids that I delivered that the moms are bringing in. They don't necessarily need pap smears, but they need to be seen. They need to be discussed. And I always, I try to educate them. So I'll divide all those people. I believe that these patients should be seen, you know, depending on the situation, especially once they're at 21 and older should be seen every year. Why? Because we talk about safe sex. We talk about self breast exam. I teach them how to examine their breasts. Pap smears, the current recommendation is, is that we don't do them until uh, starting at 21 years of age. So women who are 21 to 29 years of age, technically, depending on who you look at, the pap smear should be every three years. And papillomavirus, which is running rampant, okay, with all the uh, kids that are having uh, uh, unprotected sex, whether it be in high school or in college or whatever. The HPV testing alone can also be considered now in women just 25 to 29, but really the pap smear. So from 21 to 29, their pap smears could be every three years, but I till, still tell them if they're on a birth control pill or they're sexually active, et cetera. You know, not only do we examine them, but I look at their skin too. We live in Florida. These are patients. So we, we talk and there's a lot of emotional and physical abuse that's out there. This, instead of seeing women every three, four years, will be caught at that time. So I bring my patients back every year, but as far as pap smears, and then women from 30 to 65 years of age have the option of either three. They could either have a pap test and that papilloma virus test that goes along with it, okay? And that could be done every five years or the pap test every three years alone, or just the HPV. And then usually after 65, if they really haven't had any problems for three, four, five years, some people say you don't need to do it. Okay, well, I apologize. Uh, we're running out of time. Okay. And uh, we may have to bring you back to do another show. <laughs> No, I'd lo I would have loved to have talked about where we're at with fibroids and endometriosis. Uh, we're going we're gonna to bring, bring you back, your neighbors, you know. Uh, That's right. It would be a privilege, sir. Who knows? We may go up the street and eat at the local deli. We'll, we'll figure it out. Okay. And, and I just want to thank you for having me. It's a real privilege, sir. No, thank you very much for your, your, your advocacy and your knowledge and your kindness. You're, you're a good human being, all right? Thank you. Uh, folks, uh, we, uh, we stay, where, stay where you are. Uh, we, uh, we are at the end of this show, and I always tell you, if you have any questions, you have any uh, items you want to talk about, there's an email address and a phone number here. Remember, I always tell you to take good care of yourself. Don't hide anything from your doctors. You got to tell them what's going on. You can't just walk in after you don't feel well. You have to tell them beforehand. So remember, this show is called Dateline Health. We come to you from Nova Southeastern University. We're pleased to be in the Allen B. LeVan NSU Broward Center of Innovation. And uh, goodbye until next time. This is Fred Lipman saying see ya.